Greetings again, everybody. We will talk here about some surgical issues that implicate the thyroid. So we will talk uh, briefly about uh, the anatomy and a problem that occurs in pediatrics called the thyroglossal duct cyst. And then I've divided these up into uh, the symptoms that these generally present with. Um, but uh, this isn't this isn't uh, perfect. So they don't always necessarily present uh, this way, but this is the best way to divide them up. Um, so uh, I'll also talk about uh, thyroid nodule, uh, which is really, really important to know how to work up, uh, both for the USMLE, this is a common, common question where they give you the asymptomatic thyroid nodule and ask you what to do. It's also important for competent clinical practice because this is uh, a common way for cancer to present. And anytime you fail to diagnose cancer, you have a medical legal problem on your hands. All right, so let's talk about anatomy first. So the anatomy is a gland. Uh, it secretes thyroid hormone, which is responsible for metabolism. And it acts at the behest, usually, uh, of the anterior pituitary, which secretes thyroid stimulating hormone. That makes sense, that stimulates the thyroid. So the thyroid can be divided up into a right and left lobe. So you have a right lobe here on the right side and the left lobe here on the left side, which is connected by what's known as the isthmus of the thyroid. It can be further divided into superior and inferior poles. So your superior pole on the superior side, inferior poles on the inferior side. So you can say right superior, right inferior, left superior, left inferior, and then your isthmus. And then you've got uh, what's known as uh, a pyramidal lobe. This isn't always present. So uh, some people don't have a pyramidal lobe. Some people have a really small one that you can't see. And some people have a really large one. This one is huge. This is just to emphasize that it can be there. So a pyramidal lobe will usually come off the isthmus. As far as arterial circulation, uh, you've got uh, circulation um, both to the superior and inferior poles. Uh, so remember that uh, you're, you're not symmetrical on your right and left side, uh, so it's going to be a little bit different uh, in different people. But for the most part in everybody, uh, the, uh, uh, the artery to the superior thyroid uh, comes off of the external carotid artery on both sides. And then uh, you have an inferior thyroid artery uh, which comes off of the subclavian artery uh, or uh, a, uh, a thyroid trunk, thyrocervical trunk, uh, which may be present. So uh, the venous circulation is roughly the same. Uh, other than that, you also have, uh, venous-wise, you also have a uh, middle thyroid vein uh, in addition to a superior and inferior thyroid vein. In some people, uh, they have uh, an artery that comes up to the isthmus that comes directly off of the aortic arch. I don't know if that's shown here, but it's called the uh, thyroidia ima. So you, I don't think if you ask about that. Um, all right, nerve-wise, uh, you've got the recurrent laryngeal nerves that run past the thyroid. That's not important as far as thinking about the thyroid function, but when you're talking about thyroid surgery, it's important because it is very intimate with the thyroid. And so you have to make sure that you're not uh, messing with the recurrent laryngeal nerves. So on the right side, you have a right recurrent laryngeal nerve that runs uh, rather intimately with the subclavian artery that you see here. Uh, and then as well uh, as with the, uh, uh, with the uh, carotid artery. Uh, so it's going to cross the inferior thyroid artery, and so it's really important that you know that this is present uh, if you're doing thyroid surgery uh, so that you don't damage this uh, nerve. On the left side, you have a uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve as well. Uh, this one is commonly referred to in cardiology because it uh, wraps around the, uh, the aorta, the uh, arch of the aorta, uh, specifically around a uh, involuted fetal portion, um, uh, which is the uh, ligamentum arteriosum. And this comes back up and uh, runs uh, through the tracheoesophageal groove, gives off branches uh, to the larynx. And so this is important because if this nerve is 
damaged, it's going to cause hoarseness and vocal weakness, and this is a, uh, a very possible complication of thyroid surgery. You also have superior laryngeal nerves. Uh, they uh, run with the superior thyroid artery, and they give uh, sensory and motor branches to the larynx and cricothyroid muscle, respectively. In addition to the thyroid gland, underneath the thyroid gland, you have parathyroid glands. Uh, and those are responsible for secreting parathyroid hormone, and uh, that's involved with calcium metabolism. And damage to the parathyroid gland uh, or uh, accidental removal of the parathyroid gland when you're doing a, a subtotal thyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy is possible, and that's a complication, in which case you would have reduced parathyroid hormone, which would result in hypocalcemia. Okay, so uh, the, the thyroglossal duct cyst uh, is a, obviously a cyst, but it's a failure of the thyroglossal duct to involute. The thyroglossal duct is a fetal structure. It generally involutes around the ninth or tenth week of fetal development. And a lot of times, the thyroglossal duct cyst will also contain thyroid tissue, uh, and so that can be clinically relevant. But usually, the way that the thyroglossal duct cyst presents is as a painless neck mass in the child. In the U.S., we see kids about every year until they're in kindergarten, and this becomes relatively obvious around two or three years old. Uh, you'll see this neck mass. It doesn't bother the child. It's painless. Uh, but uh, it can cause symptoms. When does it cause symptoms? It causes symptoms if it gets big, really too big, uh, or if it becomes infected, which is possible with any cyst. Any cyst can be infected. So if it becomes too big, it can cause problems with breathing or problems with swallowing. If it becomes infected, obviously it's going to be painful. What's going to be really important on the USMLE that you know for vignettes, and also if you're going to differentiate the thyroglossal duct cyst from other possible cysts that you can have in the neck, uh, is that you know that this is a roughly midline mass, but most importantly, that it moves with tongue protrusion. And how do you remember that? Thyroglossal. Thyro meaning thyroid, glossal meaning tongue. Glossal means tongue. It's a Greek derivation from tongue. So thyroglossal moves with tongue protrusion, and that's the best way to diagnose it on physical exam. You ask the, tongue, uh, the kid to stick their tongue out, it should be easy to do, kids like to do that, and you'll see that the mass moves dramatically with tongue protrusion. Once you suspect a thyroglossal duct cyst on physical examination, the next best step is to do sonography, and that's usually what you do for most cysts, but that's going to be to just make sure that this is indeed a cyst, it's hollow, it's uh, hypoechoic on, uh, on uh, uh, sonography, and from that point you can refer them to pediatric surgery uh, where they'll get surgical excision of the thyroglossal duct cyst, uh, a common procedure called a cyst trunk procedure. Uh, the surgeon may want to do further radiology, usually will, for planning. Uh, that could be a CT or an MRI. But uh, you need to know that the best initial diagnostic step is sonography, and the treatment is excision. And we do excision because this can be infected, and it can get big, and it can cause complications, and so it's better to just remove it than leave it be. This is a thyroglossal duct cyst. It's not an Adam's apple. It's roughly in the place you'd expect an Adam's apple to be, but it most certainly is not an Adam's apple because this is a young girl, as you can see, probably about five or six years old. So it's not an Adam's apple. Here's another one. Here's another one. This one's a little bit off the midline. Might have an abscess here. It looks a little bit red. I didn't read the history on this patient. I just saw the picture. This is an obvious thyroglossal duct cyst. Uh, it's got a little bit of erythema. Uh, if you were to palpate this, if it were infected, it may be warm, fluctuant, tender. Kid might have a little bit of pain around the neck. This one's obviously infected. So, all right. So uh, we'll talk about here are some uh, problems that uh, often cause hyperthyroidism. Not always, but usually. 
So the differential diagnosis of hyperthyroidism is complex and there are a lot of things that cause it. We're only going to talk about the things that may uh, necessitate surgery. So we'll talk about Graves' disease as well as uh, the uh, things that cause nodules, Plummer's disease, which is a multinodular, toxic multinodular goiter, and then toxic adenoma, where you just have one nodule. I starred pituitary adenoma here because I said, I said these are things that necessitate surgery. Pituitary adenoma does indeed often necessitate surgery, but we're talking about problems of the thyroid here. And the pituitary adenoma is not in the thyroid. All right, so what is hyperthyroidism? What does it present like clinically? Uh, it can cause a lot of different things, but the things that you need to be aware of are intolerance to heat, increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, uh, enlarged the thyroid, uh, facial flushing, and especially in older patients, weight loss. So Graves' disease is uh, a absolute must-know, and it is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism in the United States. It's an autoimmune disorder in which the immune system creates an antibody that stimulates the thyroid. And so the thyroid doesn't know the difference between uh, getting stimulated by TSH and getting stimulated by an, by an antibody that looks like TSH, and so it's going to do the same thing either way, and that is secrete thyroid hormone. It has an increased incidence in women, and that goes with pretty much every autoimmune disorder. The symptoms of Graves' disease is basically what you see with hyperthyroidism, hypermetabolic state. You can also see uh, a specific symptom that you see in Graves' disease, and that's called exophthalmos. And that's caused from edema around the eyes, and it basically makes it look like the eyes are bulging out of the head. Uh, so that's something to, to look for. That's, uh, that's a rather specific sign of Graves' disease. Other things include uh, goiter. If the, uh, when the thyroid gets stimulated enough, it kind of hypertrophies. That's probably not the right word, but it gets larger. Uh, you also uh, can have warm, moist skin kind of uh, coinciding with that intolerance to heat and fine tremor. The best initial diagnostic step when you are suspecting Graves' disease is a TSH level. You're not going to look for thyroid hormone, you're going to look for a TSH level. Why? Because when you have elevated thyroid hormone, that can come from a lot of different things. But when you have a problem of the thyroid, what you would expect if it's hyperthyroid symptoms, you would expect a an elevated TSH. An elevated TSH causes elevated thyroid hormone, right? Well, when you have something that is stimulating the thyroid that's not TSH, you're going to have negative feedback to the anterior pituitary, and that's going to reduce your TSH. And so when you have a low TSH, but you've got hyperthyroid symptoms, there's got to be something that's stimulating the thyroid that's not TSH. And so TSH is negatively fed back. Uh, so in the process of getting TSH, you may also get T3 and T4. Those will be elevated. So it's good to know uh, the difference between primary hyperthyroidism, primary being it's coming from the thyroid itself or thyroid tissue, where you're going to have a low TSH or a, and a high T3, T4, and secondary hyperthyroidism, where the thyroid is actually getting directly stimulated by TSH, uh, in which the problem is not the thyroid, it's something outside of the thyroid, so secondary hyperthyroidism. And in that case, you'd have a high TSH and a high T3 and T4. So with Graves' disease, uh, I should add, um, most, and this is important to know medically, the most accurate test, and if you're asked this, to diagnose Graves' disease, and what you will do uh, to diagnose Graves' disease um, if you uh, suspect it, and you really should suspect it in a uh, younger woman with hypermetabolic symptoms and a low TSH, especially if she has exophthalmos, uh, you should get uh, to, uh, to cement down the diagnosis of Graves' disease. You should get a serology for thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin, and that is the, uh, the actual immunoglobulin that's stimulating the thyroid, as its name would imply. 
Okay, the best initial treatment for Graves' disease is not surgical, it's propranolol. And what's propranolol? It's a beta blocker, but you give a beta blocker to control the symptoms. So that's going to help the patient uh, feel a little bit better. We're also going to uh, go the route usually of antithyroid drugs, and I say usually because it's not always. So uh, some patients you don't want to give antithyroid drugs, um, and that's particularly pregnant patients. Now, if you do give a, an antithyroid drug to a pregnant woman, you can do it, but you're going to choose... PTU, propothiouracil, you will never, ever, 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 under any circumstances, give methamazole to a pregnant patient. Uh, but otherwise, you can choose between the two. Another route to go is radioactive iodine ablation. Uh, so in that case, you're giving, you're basically poisoning the thyroid, and so there'll be less thyroid for the thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin to stimulate, and the uh, result then will be that you'll have less thyroid hormone. We try to control the patient with non-surgical treatment if we can, but if these treatments fail or they're undesirable by the patient, then you can do a bilateral subtotal thyroidectomy, which is your surgical uh, treatment for Graves' disease. The reason we don't want to jump to this right away if we don't have to is that there are, of course, complications with surgery, uh, and those include thyroid storm, which can happen anytime you're manipulating a hyperthyroid, uh, and there's ways that we can get around that, which I will tell you in a little bit. Hemorrhage, uh, which is pretty much with any surgery. Hypoparathyroidism, remember that your parathyroids sit behind your thyroids, and if you take those out too, you will... Uh, cause hypoparathyroidism because you no longer have PTH. And it sounds easy, let's not take the parathyroids out, but they're intimately connected and uh, associated with the thyroid. It's hard to tell where the thyroid ends and where the hypo, or, and where the, the parathyroids uh, start. So this can be difficult for the surgeon. And then of course, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. So, when you are doing surgery on a patient who has hyperthyroidism, and I should rephrase that, do not operate on a patient who is hyperthyroid. What you're going to do is, so you've got a patient that you want to operate on, she's hyperthyroid, what you're going to do is bring her in, admit her, probably, and you're going to get her TSH and T3, T4 levels, which will probably be low TSH, high T3, T4 levels, you will administer antithyroid drugs uh, and uh, as well as propranolol until she is euthyroid. And we will measure her euthyroidism both in clinical symptoms, that she's got no clinical symptoms of hyperthyroidism, and that her TSH and T3, T4 are normal. At that point, we can operate on her. The problem is if we operate on a patient with hyperthyroidism, low TSH, high T3, T4, we put the patient at risk of thyroid storm, and thyroid storm is deadly. So we need to prep the hyperthyroid patient and get her euthyroid before we operate. All right, so the second most common cause of hyperthyroidism in the U.S. is Plummer's disease, which is also known as toxic multinodular goiter, and that's just where you have more than one nodule that's secreting thyroid hormone. You can also have what's known as toxic adenoma, and that's just where you have one nodule. So they're basically these are similar, like the same thing, just toxic multinodular goiter, more than one toxic adenoma, just one. And these nodules, if they're secreting hormone, they are the definition of adenoma. And adenoma is tissue that is a, a, a tumor that's secreting uh, something. So uh, Plummer's disease also known as toxic multinodular goiter, toxic adenoma is just one nodule. This, unlike, uh, un unlike Graves' disease, has an increased incidence in postmenopausal women, women over the age of 50. The presentation is relatively similar. It's hyperthyroidism. However, with the adenomas and the Plummer's disease, you've got uh, a, a less dramatic presentation in most cases. So uh, it may be just 
subtle weight loss, which we get all worked up about because oh, unintended weight loss may be cancer. Make sure anytime you have a patient with weight loss, you're always getting a thyroid or a, a, a TSH level. You can get thyroid function tests are fine too. That's going to include your T3, uh, 3T4. That's fine too, but at least, at the very least, get your TSH level. Any patient with weight loss, it's just that's always going to be part of your laboratory workup because a very common cause of weight loss is hyperthyroidism, maybe the only symptom. And occasionally, a, uh, a, a toxic uh, nodule or nodules may be asymptomatic. I wouldn't expect that on the USMLE, though. On physical exam, you're going to have all your typical symptoms of hyperthyroidism, possibly. Um, they're all potential, but weight loss and increased heart rate would be the ones that I would expect are the most common uh, to run into. What you may also have that you don't have in, uh, in Graves' disease is a nodule. You may be able to palpate a nodule. Not all the time, but uh, you may be able to palpate the nodule. So the best initial diagnostic test, again, here is TSH. Now, just like Graves' disease, you're getting excess secretion of T3 and T4 for different reasons. Here you have an adenoma. With Graves' disease, you have something stimulating the thyroid. But in both cases, it's not TSH stimulating the thyroid here. Uh, so you're going to have low TSH levels. The fact that you have low TSH levels tells you that what you've got here is a, uh, an adenoma. Uh, now, you know it's probably not Graves' disease because Graves' disease does not tend to present in postmenopausal women, and Graves' disease does not tend to give you a, nodule, a palpable nodule. But Graves' disease certainly in any patient who's got hyperthyroid symptoms that's got a low TSH is always going to be in your differential. Uh, now, what you're going to do uh, is uh, get a, if you have a palpable nodule, uh, your best next step uh, should be a radioactive iodine uptake scan, uh, and that will show you where the nodules are. Okay, so this is a radioactive iodine uptake scan, and what you're doing is administering a uh, radioactive iodine, which can then be visualized. Uh, it's a, just a scintigraphic uh, nuclear medicine test. So here's normal. So this is getting taken up by your thyroid cells, which don't know the difference between radioactive iodine and normal iodine. And so this is Graves' disease here. You've got uh, a confluent increased uptake of the radioactive iodine. So this is how you tell the difference between if this were a uh, middle-aged woman who happens to present with Graves' disease versus a middle-aged woman who uh, happens to present with uh, Plummer's disease or toxic adenoma, where you've got focal increased uptake points of, uh, of the radioactive iodine. Okay, But remember that if it's in a younger woman, I would say that the best next step would be to get the thyroid uh, immunoglobulin, the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, because uh, that doesn't subject the patient to nuclear medicine, and uh, it's more than likely uh, in a younger patient without a nodule that she has Graves' disease. So here's a toxic adenoma. You've got normal uptake here, super high uptake here. All right, so um, what do we do for treatment? What we're going to try to do is uh, to uh, reduce the uh, symptoms and to uh, uh, reduce the thyroid activity. And so this is pretty much the same treatment as, uh, as with, uh, with Graves' disease uh, in that we're administering propranolol to reduce symptoms and antithyroid drugs, PTU and methimazole, again, a pregnant patient, which it's less common to come up in a pregnant patient just because this usually comes up in older women, um, you're not giving methimazole. Radioactive iodine ablation is also possible, uh, but with this, with these nodules, uh, it's more often uh, than not that you're going to go to surgical therapy. That doesn't mean you don't do medical therapy first, it's just these often go wind up going to surgical therapy. Uh, so with Plummer's disease, you're going to do, oh, and remember to prep the patient first. So again, you've got a hyperthyroid patient. You're not going to operate them on them until they're euthyroid. 
Plummer's disease, we go to a bilateral subtotal thyroidectomy. With toxic adenoma, we just do a lobectomy. Why? Because with, a, with an adenoma, look at you've got a perfectly fine thyroid here. Here you've got uh, your adenoma, you can just take off this lobe. This lobe is fine. The nice thing about that is that you've got a functioning thyroid after that and you don't have to worry about having to give the patient thyroid hormone. Whereas if you do a bilateral subtotal thyroidectomy, a lot of times they're going to wind up hypothyroid after the surgery. So here you've got a toxic multinodular goiter. You're going to have to take out pretty much all of the thyroid. Okay. That's another one of the complications of thyroid surgery is that they wind up hypothyroid in a lot of cases. Okay, now we'll talk about uh, some thyroid problems that uh, show up as thyroiditis. Thyroiditis is just a general term for inflammation, uh, increased size of the thyroid. It may or may not be painful. So uh, back in the endocrinology section, I talked about uh, the two different kinds of thyroiditis. Um, I should say differential diagnosis of thyroiditis here. Uh, both, there's both painful thyroiditis and non-painful thyroiditis. So we're going to talk about suppurative thyroiditis, which is rather rare, uh, and then non-painful uh, thyroiditis, uh, which the only one in here that you're going to work on surgically is Riedel's thyroiditis. Okay. So separative thyroiditis is rare, and the reason it's rare is because the uh, thyroid itself has a very, very rich lymphovascular supply, as you saw when we were talking about the anatomy. And so because of that, it's uncommon for bacteria to be able to proliferate in the thyroid. But in patients who are immunocompromised, they can get infections of the thyroid. So the symptoms of an infection over the thyroid, which is usually in the form of an abscess, is going to be all your typical symptoms of an abscess, which is pain, tenderness, and erythema over the thyroid gland, kind of looking like that infected thyroglossal duct cyst, but it's an, an immunocompromised adult, and it's over the thyroid, not cyst. Uh, so uh, what you're going to notice here in your workup is that your thyroid function tests are normal. You just have an infection of the thyroid. Other than that, the thyroid is working normally. The CBC will usually show elevated white blood cells, but because this often occurs in immunocompromised patients, they may have a defected uh, immune, uh, they do have an, a defected immune system, and so they may not respond with an elevation of white in their white count. So the best initial diagnostic step for a separative thyroiditis, if you're suspecting that, is to get a CT. Why? Because you need to know exactly where this is at, um, because this is going to necessitate surgery. Uh, and so you, you're going to get a CT, and then after you get a CT, you know exactly where it's at, you can do a radiologically guided needle aspiration. Uh, you'll take the pus out, you'll culture it, and then you're going to start the patient on antibiotics. Um, the antibiotics, uh, you, you're going to start as soon as you get the pus out. Um, and so the antibiotics that you uh, need to start are uh, things that target uh, the most common, and you want broad spectrum antibiotics, but you want to target the most common causes, and those are staph and strep, and that's going to include MRSA. So the best antibiotics uh, to use um, that I've seen in the literature uh, would be uh, Piperacillin, Tazobactam, and Vancomycin. Uh, and then that's, of course, pending culture results. You can change that when the culture results come back. The definitive surgical therapy, and it's always surgical for separative thyroiditis, is an open drainage. So open drainage, broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, for diagnosis, it's going to be CT initially, and then needle aspiration. In patients who don't have a history of known immunocompromisation, of course, what is a big common cause of uh, acquired immunodeficiency in the United States? Well, it would be the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. So consider recommending an HIV test in patients with no known history of immunodeficiency. Uh, and I say recommend because in the U.S., you cannot just go ahead and order an HIV test on a patient. You need to get their signed and written consent. Uh, and I guess that would be probably state, based on states, but USMLE would... Uh, expect you to know the most restrictive laws, and that would be that you need to get written consent from the patient to get an HIV test on them. And there are exceptions to that if the patient uh, 
bit somebody during surgery and may have infected somebody else, but that is, doesn't matter. Uh, but just know that HIV test is one of those special tests that you have to get the patient's consent. You can't just order it like you can a CBC, a thyroid function tests, uh, strep culture, whatever. All right. Uh, Riedel's thyroiditis is another relatively rare condition uh, in which the thyroid uh, it becomes densely fibrotic. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a idiopathic condition, uh, but it's pretty apparent when it happens. Uh, so this is uh, on presentation, a middle-aged woman, usually you can kind of see the pattern here, there's a lot of women uh, with these thyroid problems, presenting with compressive symptoms and a and you'll probably give, be given this analogy somehow on the USMLE, a rock hard or a stone hard thyroid on examination. So Riddell's thyroiditis is commonly associated with hypothyroidism, but, uh, and that's just because you've got fibrosis of the thyroid gland, so it's not functioning anymore. Uh, but the presenting symptom will typically be related to the compression. Uh, of the rock hard thyroid. And so those compressive symptoms include dyspnea, dysphagia, tightness, neck pressure, hoarseness, coughing. Uh, the thyroid itself, though, is not painful. So for diagnosis, when you've got this rock hard thyroid, uh, you've got compressive symptoms, you're immediately going to send the patient for a surgical biopsy. And when you have compressive symptoms of the thyroid, generally that's going to necessitate surgery. You can't just let patients go around with dyspnea and dysphagia. They're going to need some kind of surgical help uh, for uh, that thyroid. Uh, but what you're going to do here, though, rather than take the thyroid out, which is not what you're doing, you're going to do a biopsy. And the biopsy is done to exclude carcinoma because uh, this kind of thyroid may be cancer, may have cancer. So you want to do a biopsy to exclude carcinoma. As far as treatment though, most of the time this is just treated medically. So uh, you'll give prednisone to reduce the inflammation uh, and any uh, further fibrosis and hypothyroidism, uh, those symptoms can be treated with thyroxine as usual. Surgical therapy may be done, uh, especially if, when there's compressive symptoms, but we don't want to remove a lot of the thyroid here. It's usually, uh, it's usually discouraged because the fibrosis can continue even when the, the thyroid's not there. Uh, so Riedel's thyroiditis is typically treated medically uh, and as needed when there's compression. But remember that you're getting a biopsy because you have to exclude Riedel's thyroiditis from cancer. So here's some of your causes of thyroiditis. Uh, these two we talked about, separative and Riedel's, which both uh, will necessitate surgery either for uh, treatment or for diagnosis, uh, and then some of these other ones that are medical. And here's a differential um, that you can use, an algorithm. I went over this in depth in the medical section. All right, so now we'll talk about the thyroid nodule. So the approach to the thyroid nodule, uh, you gotta know this really, really, really well because you will be given a thyroid nodule or three or five on the USMLE somewhere and you're gonna be uh, expected to know how to work these up. Uh, so thyroid nodules are typically discovered on routine examination, patients just coming in for their annual wellness check and you notice a bump on their thyroid. And Anytime you're examining a patient, especially, uh, well, any patient technically, but especially a patient, woman in their, her 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond, you should be examining the thyroid because she is uh, a, a higher risk to have uh, thyroid issues. So uh, any thyroid nodule that you, uh, that you discover, and usually it is on routine examination, needs to be clinically excluded from being a malignancy, even though most thyroid nodules are benign, like 90%. Uh, so the important factors that go into whether we suspect it's, ben it's benign or we suspect it's malignant is uh, as follows. And like I said, most are benign and we always have to exclude malignancy, but there are certain things that uh, may make the patient more likely to have a malignancy than other patients. And so first off is age. Uh, so with children, 
the uh, nodules are benign 90% of the time, those odds go up, especially after age 40. So uh, age correlates with malignancy. Sex. So women are more likely to have thyroid cancer. But if a patient has a thyroid nodule, the men are more likely to have a malignant nodule. So women get thyroid nodules more than men do. But when a woman has a thyroid nodule, she's more likely to have a benign thyroid nodule than a man is. When men get thyroid nodules, uh, they're more malignant than when women get thyroid nodules. So hopefully that makes sense. So women are more likely to develop thyroid nodules and women are more likely to have thyroid malignancy. But when a man develops a thyroid nodule, percentage wise, he's more likely, his thyroid nodule is statistically more likely to be malignant than a woman's is. Family history. Medullary thyroid cancer follows uh, a family history in a lot of cases. So there are isolated medullary thyroid cancers that can be inherited, and there is also multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2, uh, and that uh, affects, uh, puts the patient at risk for medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, I think it's a 100% risk, so you're going to have to, in, in med, uh, MEN type 2, you're going to, in many cases, do a prophylactic thyroidectomy. Uh, all right, so uh, radiation exposure uh, to the head or the neck for therapeutic purposes or otherwise, especially as a child, that increases your risk for a thyroid nodule. Radiation exposure in general, if you get it as a kid, it's much more problematic than if you get it as an adult. Um, not exactly sure why that is, but radiation exposure to the head or neck, especially as a child. Nodule characteristics, so firm nodules are more likely to be malignant than soft nodules. And then cervical lymphadenopathy, of course, that suggests malignancy, and vocal change also suggests malignancy. So when you have a thyroid nodule, the best initial diagnostic step is going to be thyroid function tests. So thyroid function tests, meaning a TSH and your thyroid hormones, but definitely the TSH. Remember back to the toxic adenoma and plumber's disease, which are toxic nodules. Toxic just means they're secreting T3 or T4. If you have a low TSH, it means that you're secreting T3 and T4. And you can have a toxic adenoma, but be asymptomatic, not have hyperthyroid symptoms. Uh, and in that case, you would have a low TSH, but no symptoms. And if you do have a low TSH, you can pretty much rule out that this is a malignancy, and you can treat the toxic adenoma symptomatically um, or uh, with antithyroid uh, medications if necessary. Uh, but a low TSH effectively rules out thyroid cancer. Uh, a normal TSH, however, will necessitate further uh, examination, further workup. So there is some disagreement among the resources that I have seen. Some say that a radioactive iodine uptake test should be done. Some say that it doesn't need to be done. I side with the uh, uh, that it should be done, uh, but it's not absolutely necessary. So if you are asked on the USMLE uh, what the best next step is after getting thyroid function tests uh, and it comes back normal, and so therefore we're still considering cancer, then you should get uh, a fine needle aspiration next. Um, but in clinical practice, a lot of times you're going to get a uh, radioactive iodine uptake scan uh, because you want to know, do you have multiple nodules or do you just have one nodule? Remember, not all nodules are palpable. So you want to see if there are more nodules in the patient. So. Uh, Remember back to when we were talking about the adenomas, if it's a hot nodule, meaning increased uptake, then it's a toxic adenoma or TMG. Uh, and if it's a cold nodule, uh, then of course that's going to be suspicious for carcinoma. Okay, so the radioactive iodine uptake technically is optional, although in most cases, clinicians will opt to do it. So cold nodules or a normal TSH should be followed up with a fine needle aspiration. And a fine needle aspiration, uh, what this is, is you're 
pulling out whatever is in the nodule. And in some cases, it's fluid. That's all that it is. And remember, soft nodules, soft nodules are oftentimes cystic. Uh, so in some cases, it's fluid. And you're still going to send that off for cytologic analysis because there can be cells in the fluid. Uh, but a lot of times, if it's just cystic, there's no cells in it, uh, they, can be, they can just be observed. If they're solid nodules and you're getting cells out of it, uh, of course, you're sending that off for cytologic analysis. There's various things that the pathologist, the cytopathologist can tell you, and those are going to implicate how you treat the patient. So, of course, if it's malignancy, then it's cancer. You're treating the patient for cancer. That's invariably going to result in a, a thyroidectomy. Uh, they may tell you follicular abnormality. That's also going to result in an excision. Uh, Herthel cells, which uh, Herthel cells I talked about in the endocrinology section, but what a, what Herthel cells are uh, are possibly benign, possibly malignant. So what we have to do is we have to excise the tumor to see if it's benign or malignant. A fine needle aspiration cannot give you a diagnosis of malignant Herthel cells or benign Herthel cells. Unfortunately, you have to look at the tumor itself. So with Herthel cells, if they're there, you need to excise. Adenomatous hyperplasia, uh, actually, you know what, I think I just, I just, uh, okay, yeah, I, I've got these so you can see them here. Okay, so adenomatous hyperplasia, you can treat with antithyroid drugs and watch for regression. Uh, if it doesn't regress, you should excise it. And then, of course, if it's an indeterminate thyroid nodule, you can repeat the FNA. Um, that's what you should do, because you probably didn't get a good sample. Uh, so these are five different ways it can come back. And you should be aware of these. So here's cold nodules. Uh, so you've got a nodule, but you're not taking up thyroid uh, stimulating hormone, or uh, sorry, you're not taking up iodine. So here it is, both on the left side. Here. All right. So here's uh, an algorithm, what you can do for uh, a thyroid nodule. When you get normal TFTs back, you can do a radioactive iodine uptake scan. Uh, it's technically optional for the USMLE, so clinical practice, I would do an RAIU scan, but on the USMLE, I would say the next best step is a fine needle aspiration. Uh, so you need to know cytology-wise, uh, if it's carcinoma, of course, you're treating that with excision, usually plus or minus radiation. Depends on what kind of carcinoma it is. I do a whole section on thyroid cancer, so you can go back and look at that in the medical section. Follicular abnormality, you're going to excise. Herthel cells, you're going to excise and biopsy. Adenomatous hyperplasia, you will treat with antithyroid drugs and then uh, have the patient come back. If it shrinks, you can observe it. If there's no change, you'll repeat the FNA. If it grows, you'll excise it. If it's indeterminate, you'll just repeat the FNA in hopes of getting a result next time. So the thyroid carcinomas, even though I did a whole section on this, I'll just briefly bring these up. Papillary thyroid carcinoma is the most common type of thyroid cancer. It's about 60 to 70%. It spreads lymphatically. It's associated strongly with a history of radiation exposure. The treatment is a near total thyroidectomy uh, with or without adjunctive radiotherapy. This has a really good prognosis uh, in the long term. Follicular thyroid cancer usually occurs in the elderly. Uh, a lot of times uh, it spreads hematogenously, so uh, unfortunately there can be metastases. Uh, the treatment here is going to be a near total thyroidectomy, and a lot of times you're going to uh, do radioiodine ablation uh, because there may be cancer cells in the blood. Medullary thyroid cancer, uh, in this case, uh, you, you're going to want to do a total thyroidectomy. And the reason why is because uh, these are usually associated with familial syndromes. And if you have medullary thyroid cancer in one place, uh, you'll probably develop it somewhere else in your thyroid. So you just want to take all the thyroid tissue out and then treat them with, uh, with uh, exogenous levothyroxine. Uh, so this is associated with elevated levels of calcitonin and serotonin. So on your chemistry, you may see a low blood calcium. And then anaplastic thyroid carcinoma is uh, the death sentence, unfortunately, for thyroid cancer. It's very painful. 
terminal, 80% uh, mortality within one year of diagnosis. Only about 5% are living after five years. The treatment here is palliative. There's not much we can do. We're not going to excise the thyroid because there's really no point. It can't be cured. All right, um, so any questions, feel free to let me know in the comments below.